Hello, and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 18, titled The Fix. It originally premiered on March 7th, 1986. The director is Dick Miller. Miller. This is the only episode that he directed, but you know who Dick Miller is. Now, there's a theme in this episode. It is chock full of guest stars. And this is our first guest star, because we're going to have a whole segment just about the guest stars in this. Dick Miller is a character actor from like 50 movies. He was in Little Shop of Horrors, The Terminator, Pulp Fiction. He was also the neighbor in Gremlins. That, that I could go on and fiction? on and on. He ended up getting cut. And then got put back in in the director's cut. Oh. Yeah. So you will recognize him as this 80s podcast and the 80s movie of Gremlins. He's the quirky neighbor to the family that seems to know everything about everything, right? Yeah. He's mm, like the nosy gotcha. neighbor and he gets, they run him over with his tractor, don't they? Or is he the guy yeah. that goes on top of the roof to fix the antenna? It's his tractor. Yeah. He okay, gets, yeah. He gets hit by the tractor. It kind of crashes through the living room. Yeah. Yeah. So he's. He's been in 200 movies. He's been in basically every movie that you've loved from the 80s. He's in it. The writer is Chuck Adamson. And, John, there's some crossover here because we've already seen his work in the episodes The Home Invaders and Give a Little, Take a Little. We have a little bit more vice veterans as we get into some of the guest stars, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Before we get started, with checking in to see what's going on in each other's lives. And, John... This was a big week for sports, for sports nerds, stat nerds. Yeah, so a little bit about me personally. I am a huge football nerd. I will watch anything football. College football, high school football, NFL football. Hell, I'll even watch Canadian football sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> As a football nerd, the NFL draft is one of the big things that comes around during the offseason. Probably one of the only things that that us football fans can get excited about during the offseason. And every year, I watch it as a spectator. And this year, I thought I would do something different. I thought I would do research. I jumped. I joined draft twitter and got (laughs) super nerdy into it read everything i could i was prepared i had a board like i was a gm (laughs) i thought for sure i was i had this thing figured out and within about the first 15 picks i realized i know absolutely nothing about this I, i am i am clueless on how this process works it is just amazing like There's... and not only me but like all of the experts i was following and reading their articles like it's it's we were all wrong it's just a crapshoot as a recovering sports addict i under totally understand where you're coming from and i'm I'm 90% sure that the reason why these boards fall apart because you're looking at it too scientifically, John. Because when GMs get into that room, they don't make a pick based on numbers or or any scientific fact. They come in and say, I like the look in his eyes. (laughs) Yeah, the look in his eyes. I'm starting to realize that. And as Kansas City Chief fan, I am realizing that my GM is weird. (laughs) The only thing I can predict about my GM's draft style every year, the only thing I can for sure predict is that he is going to draft a kid from from a school that I have never heard of before. See, go with the Heat fans. You thought we could go the easy way and, and talk about anything else, but we worked in some football references here in a basketball episode but just to make sure i'm going to mention the fire festival this week because just because the whole internet is talking about it we're not going to talk about it here i just want to say the words fire festival (laughs) there i said it (laughs) so let's go over and talk about this episode that is full to the brim of sports and guest stars all right so this week we're going to start off a little bit different Normally, we go right into the opening section and then we go to the credits. But this week, there are so many guest stars, big guest stars in this episode. We're going to start with talking about them because they are really important throughout the entire episode. And there are two NBA players that are in this episode. So not only is this full of huge guest stars, but the first one out of the gate, like not out of the gate, but the the main character is the one and only Bill Russell. And Bill Russell, I mean, probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, as a Celtics fan, uh, (laughs) 
basketball players in the history of the sport. I mean, he helped change the way the game is played. At six foot nine, Bill Russell played from 1956 to 1969 for the Celtics. And from 66 to 69, he was both a player and coach of the Celtics. (laughs) Wow. That is a totally different era. Yeah, exactly. I mean, could you imagine LeBron James also being the coach of the Cavaliers? (laughs) Yeah, I could. (laughs) He can do anything he wants to do. He can do it all. (laughs) uh, Maybe that's a bad example because he kind of runs that team anyway. So, but (laughs) that aside, Bill Russell, outside of playing for the Celtics and being a a five-time MVP, 12-time All-Star, and winning 11 championships. He also coached the Seattle Supersonics from 73 to 77 and the Sacramento Kings in, well, just the one year in 87 to 88. A little bit that you might not know is that when he came out of college, he actually turned down an offer to play for the Harlem Globetrotters. Good call on that one, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think he really wanted to play for the Generals, but they didn't give him an offer. <laughs> he wouldn't give him um, an offer, yeah. <laughs> something else you might not know is that he won a gold medal in the 1956 Olympics before technically going pro. And he was <clears throat> technically drafted by the St. Louis Hawks, but then traded to the Celtics. So he wasn't uh... actually drafted by the Celtics. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's that era where that that stuff happened a lot, where they they yeah, shuffled you, players around pre-draft or right after draft. Yeah, you draft a player and then you trade that player before he even suits up for you to another team. Bill Russell's not even the only NBA player in this episode. His son, who's Matt, his name is Matt in this episode, was also an NBA player, and he was currently playing in the NBA <laughs> uh, when this episode aired. Bernard King. Plays Matt, and he played in the NBA from 1977 to 1993. He's not quite the uh, legend Bill Russell is, being that he played for a bunch of different teams. The Nets, the Jazz, the Warriors, the Knicks, and even the Bullets. His heyday was really with the Knicks, and he did one thing that only a handful of players ever did. He scored 50 points in back-to-back games with the Knicks. Which is, it's so, basketball is so crazy when you hear those kinds of things, because there's like, relative unknowns can hold big records like that, right? They can score 50 points out of nowhere. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when he did it with the Knicks, the last person who had done it, who had done it, was, had done it in the early 60s. There's, mm. I want to say there's only like five people who have ever done that. Yeah, um, it's like looking at the list of baseball players who have hit for a cycle. Outside of basketball, he, we also have a Seinfeld guest star in Michael Richards. Yeah, Michael Richards plays Pagone. And of <laughs> course, we all know Michael Richards as Kramer. Some of us, unfortunately, Fortunately, know him from the Laugh Factory incident that happened mm-hmm. in 2006, where he dropped an N bomb multiple times on stage. Yeah, but not uh, a bright moment. No, no, and that pretty much still haunts him to this day. Where it's over ten years later, struggles to get work. It is just it's tarnished his image to the point where the only stuff he's really done since are things basically that other Seinfeld affiliate people have hired him for. Yeah, he made yeah, a guest like- appearance in the B movie. He made a guest appearance on Curb Your Enthusiasm, and mm-hmm. a guest appearance on Christy, which technically is in the Seinfeld reference, but I'm pretty sure that's a Christy Alley reference. <laughs> I- I- I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with the show Christy, so yeah, don't at me. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit career-wise, he was an actor and comedian. He started his career doing a short-lived comedy routine with Ed Bagley Jr. (laughs) before doing stand-up full-time. And then Billy Crystal, while he was doing stand-up, he caught Billy Crystal's eye. And Billy Crystal took him on tour with him and then got him a role on... Fridays, which was ABC's version of SNL. Kind of like an he almost that, live, like what was it? They yeah. had that in Seattle. Yeah, yeah. So he did that from 80 to 82. His first movie was Young Doctors in Love. He would appear on such 80s television shows other than Vice as St. Elsewhere, Cheers, and Scarecrow and Miss King, which I have no idea what that is. I know yeah. what that is. It was a guy and he was like an undercover FBI agent or something. And she was a teacher. So he was Scarecrow and she was Miss King. And then they would go around solving crimes together. I don't I don't know. <laughs> My mom liked that because she liked 
like the guy in it she, because it's Bruce. It's Bruce Boxleiter. I'm pretty sure the mm. guy from uh, Tron, Dominic. Sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, the guy from Tron. The other <laughs> mm-hmm. guy from Tron, not Jeff Bridges, the other guy. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. so my mom thought he was attractive, so we watched that show. <laughs> <laughs> A few movies that Michael Richards was in, he was in UHF, which I believe mm-hmm. is the Weird Al Yankovic yeah. movie. Yep. Yeah, that's yep. good. Yeah, yeah. He was also in Coneheads, So I Married an Axe Murderer, Airheads, and he even had a short-lived show after Seinfeld called The Michael Richards Show, which was canceled after seven episodes. <laughs> <laughs> so you would think we would stop here, but no, we still have two more that are on my list. And so we're just going to quickly go through the last people here. We have Harvey Firestein, who you would recognize from Miss Doubtfire, but he is a vastly accomplished stage actor. He's a huge Broadway actor. Also, just throwing it out there, you would also know him from Independence Day. He was the producer oh, yes. for Jeff Goldblum. Yes. yes. Remember, I need to call my mom. I need to call my therapist. I need to call my lawyer. Well, forget about my lawyer. <laughs> yes, yes. And then we also have someone who is in The Warriors that makes an appearance in yeah. this episode, too. Paul Greco. Paul Greco was the gang leader of the orphans in the movie The Warriors, 1979. He also appeared in Crocodile Dundee, The Cable Guy, and... A movie called Next of Kin with Patrick Swayze and Liam ne- uh, Neeson. That I love that movie. Sounds like a winner. I, I got to see that. <laughs> okay, one. <laughs> I figured Melissa would know it when I saw Patrick Swayze and Liam Neeson. I, yeah. I was like, how come I've never heard of this movie? And I was like, I bet you Melissa knows it. <laughs> it's a really good movie. Patrick Swayze has to avenge his brother's death, and I'm pretty sure Liam Neeson is the bad guy in it. So, he, and his brother's murdered at the beginning, and then, you know, Patrick Swayze being a badass, he has to go around <laughs> and avenge it. <laughs> we also have a couple people who have been in other Vice episodes, including one of the ones that the writer, that Chuck Adamson, had written. Yeah, we have Marco the Goon. So, these are a couple of the bit part guys. Marco the Goon was also in the episode Made for Each Other. He played John, and he was the middleman that they went to to sell the stolen goods to. We would also know him from one of my music segments because he's the drummer from the band Oingo Boingo. (laughs) (laughs) I love that name. (laughs) <laughs> I love that name, too. The other bit part is we have a guy who plays just known as the Big Thug. His name is Mike Fitzgerald, and he was a radio DJ in Miami at the time. Radio DJ most of his career until his wife passed away. So at the time, he was a radio DJ, guest star, uh, well, not guest starring, playing a bit role in Miami Vice and playing a bit role in Revenge of the Nerds, too. So the only reason <laughs> I want to bring up Mike Fitzgerald is because he ties back into our main guest star in that after his wife passed away, he got into, he started setting up uh, sports memorabilia signings. To this day, he weekly works with Bill Russell, uh, <laughs> setting up autograph signings for him. <laughs> there's so many people. I think, I think we're just gonna, this is where we're gonna capture it. I think there's a couple other ones in there, but these are the biggest ones episode and because because i'm gonna say right now they may not help this episode much having all these guest stars the acting wasn't necessarily better because they were all in this they're just people we recognize (laughs) yeah 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 (laughs) i i I will say this i really liked this episode i don't know if Mm. i'm alone in that no i I actually really like i really like this episode but i felt like my one complaint about it was that they quickly jumped through stuff as fast as possible to bang mm-hmm. it out. Mm-hmm. And I felt like if they had actually gone into a little more detail, that this could have been a two-part episode easily. It's been a while since we've had a two-part episode. I would welcome that. So let's actually go into this episode now. Let's go talk about what is happening in this episode after covering to see extensive guest stars that are in this episode. So when we open up, we're at the Miami Zoo. It, it You can see the tram. There's the big, it's a big bird uh, sanctuary, kind of. And we get a lot of close-up shots. of. They really stretch this one out. For all the stuff you're saying, John, that there's that they, they rush the story, maybe if they would have cut down on the amount of video on birds, they would have had some more time. <laughs> they were bird-watching. Yes, I know. 
<laughs> I, it, it just two partners hanging out at the zoo. I mean, you know. nothing more nothing romantic weird. than that. <laughs> yeah. Well, the whole vice team is there. They better make a bust on someone named Ortega. They're all spread out. This is bust time. They're hiding in the bushes. Zito and Switek are there. Tubbs and Crockett. I, you know, I don't remember seeing the ladies at this one, but. I, it looks like the whole vice team is there. They see a limo pull up. A couple of people get out. They go to make a drug deal. They're watching the deal, making sure that it happens. They also notice that someone named Berlis, Berlos. I can't, I'm not sure how they pronounce his last name. I think that's, it's Berlioz. I think that's how you pronounce okay. it. No, I think I think you're right the first time. I think it's Berlioz because okay. it's B-E-R-L-I-O-Z. So I'll, I'm I'm gonna go with Berlioz. That's what I'm I'm gonna stick with that. <laughs> Say it wrong the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> they're waiting for the deal when the deal is done one person one of the bodyguards pulls out a gun and kills the person that they're doing the deal with so of course the vice team comes rushing in crockett captures one of the people and then Tubbs chases down the shooter and is able and then further into the bird sanctuary shoots and kills him this is our big thug mike fitzgerald running away with the suitcase he he kills one guy he leaves burloys alone because you know he's the leader of the orphans so i guess he didn't <laughs> want to pick that fight <laughs> But he's running with a semi-automatic gun and keeps turning around and spraying into the bushes back at Tubbs. And of course, a semi-automatic weapon is no match for Tubbs' little thirty-eight pistol. <laughs> um, but my question to you guys is, whatever happened to Tubbs' sawed-off shotgun? Yeah, he hasn't had that in a while. He had it, um, I'm trying to think, when was the last time I saw it with him? Like, yeah, like two or three episodes back he had it, but he hasn't carried it for a while. I think he only uses that for, like, the big busts or something. <laughs> <laughs> he needs the heavy firepower, you know. Well, they rushed the limo. They they open up because Ortega never actually got out. Those these, these three people that went to make the deal went. Well, I guess they didn't go bad. It went as planned for Ortega. But then the vice team moved in. They open up and you just hear someone yell out, "Ortega, you're a woman!" And there's a woman inside the limo, fancy, looking very nice, doesn't say anything. And then we cut to to the opening credits. When we come back from the opening credits, we go to the. I had it listed as a horse track, and you find out it's just a track of everything. The racing dogs, oh, horses, babies, it's... miniature cars. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, I think because it, it, it it's a track montage, and I was confused, too, because I was like, wait a minute, are the dogs chasing the horses? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> um, but they just, they, they jump through this montage of Bill Russell, uh, the judge, betting at the track and continually, like, losing, because apparently he's a terrible gambler. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because he's just um, losing horrifically all over the place. Yeah, and so I think what they're trying to show is that he's at different tracks, like he's at different tracks. But what's weird is, is that they show the horse track first, and then mm -hmm. from there, it's dog track, dog track, dog track, dog track. <laughs> so it, it just, it looks weird, you know. That's why I thought the dogs were chasing the horses. <laughs> so bill russell is playing judge ferguson he's got a gambling problem we also meet harvey firestein as benedict who's a lawyer that comes to talk to bill russell or to judge ferguson at the track he lets them know that there's a case cut coming up with someone named ortega that th could talk and spill a lot of I information basically he's asking i'm gonna need a favor from you judge and we find out more information about that in the next scene but this horse montage or dog montage goes on forever mm -hmm. when the dogs finally get tired the next day we head over to the courthouse and melissa this is a courthouse for the ages. <laughs> this is like, I mean, I think it's in brochures for the 80s. Like, this is how you want to design your uh, sets if you want it to look like the 80s. Or also if you want it to look like a, a Tetris game came to life, right? Because yeah, like the like... windows in there are like Tetris, those, those stupid Tetris yeah. ones where they drop and they always mess you up. It's those ones where you can flip them back and forth. And they have only control yeah. in one spot and they just screw you over every time. That's what the windows look like. And then the block. It, it is know. the most <laughs> it, it's like the most 80s courthouse ever we are clearly not at miami dade courthouse yeah it exactly looks like, it's a it fancy like, courthouse <laughs> <laughs> it looks like courthouse by duplo yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the desks are blocks the podium that the judge is up on is giant blocks the walls are purple the blocks are silver i I can't even, the descriptions that we could give about the score, don't give it justice. Just pause this, go put on the episode The Fix, 
Go to the go to the courthouse scene and take a look for yourself. Yeah, there's no way to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny too is that uh, when we first started the beginning of this series, we had a few shots at the courthouse, and it was very much Florida, good old boy style courthouse. They must have just remodeled. Yeah, I think they did. <laughs> This scene, we see Crockett testify. Ortega is in court. Benedict is her lawyer. Crockett testifies. This is a bond hearing. So, the, and the state is asking for a $2 million bond because Ortega is an international fight risk. Benedict stands up and gives a very nice speech about her being pregnant and all these other harsh. Her boyfriend had a back injury. What does it have to do with going to prison? That bugged the crap out of me. What does that have to do with uh, going to prison? I don't care if your husband or your boyfriend hurt his back. <laughs> what does that matter? I don't know, but I'm, uh, you know, they just, they, they got me wrapped up in Ortega at this point because now I'm interested. She's a criminal. She's preggers. Um, she, her boyfriend's got back problems, you know, and she still hasn't even talked yet, you know, and I'm like, man, I wonder where this is going. <laughs> but no, we start to put it together like, oh, Judge Ferguson has a gambling problem. Benedict, the lawyer, comes to him and basically pays Ferguson to get his clients off, you know, dismiss cases, lower bond. And that's exactly what the judge does here. He says, we're all humans here. I'm going to set the bond at 7000 instead of $2 million that the state was asking. And Tubbs and Crockett are shocked. So... My favorite part of this scene is is the very is at the end of it. Crockett makes a comment about how he's very suspicious of the judge, but the DA he's like, "Hey, you know, uh, I'm opening a private practice in two weeks, so whatever, <laughs> really you know." Care. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and and, and and my thought is is like, so Crockett is suspicious of the judge for dropping the bond, uh, you know, down to nothing. But he's not suspicious of the DA who basically just said, like, I'm quitting and opening a practice in two weeks. So, yeah, like, it sounds an awful lot like the that DA is saying, note to self, Judge Ferguson can be bought. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Later at the precinct, this is, Trudy, Trudy, you got to find another <laughs> job. You, I know. You, you gotta leave the Miami Vice. Like, there's something better out there for you. We, we're rooting they, for you. Clean up that resume. They treat her like a secretary. <laughs> She's carrying the largest stack of files I have ever seen, and Sonny stops her to help her work his computer. Like, she doesn't have something to do. Her arms are full of files. Well, this is, so this was great. She made yeah. copies of all that paperwork and brought it to him. And he says, Trudy, I don't need any of this. It's all here on the computer. Because he finally learned how to use the computer. He, he figured out how to turn it on. And he was like, I don't need you anymore, Trudy. <laughs> on the side note, he types like our, our dad does, like one <laughs> finger at a time. Like, poke, poke, poke. So my question here on the computer. Though is is did Sunny never know how to use it, or just doesn't need Trudy anymore? And he can always use it. He just took this case personally, and he just he decided to actually use the computer himself this time. He's been faking it. What? I guess is what I'm getting at. He's why didn't he it. stop Trudy from having to make all those copies? Yeah, why did he tell her he, he knew how to use it? <laughs> so Trudy, here's what we're telling you: get a typewriter, write up that resume. Send it around. Send it around for proofing in your in your friend group. That way you can get out there, you know, and apply for other positions. Homicide seems like they need a lot of help. You would fit in well at homicide. <laughs> yeah, they need help because they can't solve nothing by themselves. <laughs> and and if you're willing, you know, if you're willing to move, you know, you could probably get a recommendation from like Tubbs to like homicide mm -hmm. in uh, New York, or well, maybe not robbery. We don't think the people in robbery <laughs> like Tubbs anymore. That's why they let. Go. Well, I um, mean, New York seems to take anyone considering Valerie murdered someone in cold blood and she still has a job with the New York Police Department. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> Just saying, they have connections in New York and Chicago. I mean, she doesn't have to stay here. And, uh... What Crockett and Trudy, because she made all those copies, even though they didn't use them, has figured out <laughs> is that Ferguson has been lowballing all kinds of of bails hearings he's been dismissing cases homicide has been the same thing there there's something really suspicious happening with judge ferguson but there tubbs and crockett are having this conversation as if they were inside of a little tiny bubble they are directly on top of each other i thought they yeah, were gonna I kiss <laughs> I was wondering, like, why are they whispering? Well, I think they're trying to play it safe, right? Because they talk, they go talk to dad and Castillo 
They tell him, hey, he, he's a real success story. He played in the NBA. His kid playing college with the quote unquote Sun Blazers. He <laughs> could have run for mayor. Like he's really well regarded in the city, but they see all these things. They're trying to be secretive because they don't want anyone else to find out that they're investigating a judge. Castillo at first says, take it to justice, but then the duo push, say, no, let us handle it. They're going to go check in with Berlioz and then Ber- Berlioz, whatever it is, who that was part of the bust and then they'll go from there Cassio says okay but if anything comes up like just let me know keep keep me in the loop so by the way just to give some context they mentioned the sun blazers at the time in the city of miami they didn't actually have an nba team yet the miami heat did not exist at this point in time at that at this time they had the floridians an Hmm. aba team an Ah, american basketball association team so, and as far as I was little, understand, the University of Miami was not allowed to have a basketball team at that time either. They didn't get one to like the 86, 87 season or something like that. Actually, that's when this episode was released. The University of Miami had their first season after a 14-year hiatus. <clears throat> so mm-hmm. basketball was back. So and <laughs> on, a, uh, on a little trivia side note, when they did get an NBA team... It almost called them the Miami Vice, but they got out of the <laughs> and ended up going with the Miami Heat. <laughs> yes, <laughs> brutal. So, bring it to was playing. They mentioned to him that, well, he says that he's got a long sentence upcoming. And then he lets slip that he's heard that Benedict, that Ortega had Benedict as a lawyer because Benedict has an in with Ferguson. He, they can buy their way out of being out of, out of cases, essentially. So the duo come up with kind of a plan, which would be to give Berlioz the money to hire Be- Benedict so that they can corner him and Ferguson in, in on their deal. When they come out of that meeting with Berlioz, Dubs and Vice crock it out for a pina colada. He says, no, let's go to a basketball game. <laughs> <laughs> Pina coladas, like they don't drink those. <laughs> <laughs> Tell time acclimating to Miami. He, does, he doesn't know that the locals don't actually drink pina coladas. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so we head out to, luckily, the Sun Blazers were playing a basketball game that night. So they just head out to, to go watch a Sun Blazers game, which looks, appears at one angle sold out, but another angle is totally empty. And we have our yeah. first basketball montage. I think first and only, I, I can say with confidence, I don't think you get another basketball montage in this show. <laughs> <laughs> don't think, anyway. Judge so, and- Ferguson is there, and he's watching his son, who's the star player on the whatever college this is, Sun, Sun Blazers team. And Bill really, really, really enjoys basketball. I mean, he has got this giddy look on his face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He is pretty excited about his son playing, you can tell. <laughs> this moment is my favorite moment in the entire episode because the cra- the crowd's going wild. Bill's just looking so ecstatic on the sideline watching his son play. His son's playing great. Tubbs turns to Crockett and says, quote, you ever get a standing ovation? And Crockett says, quote, not since I got rid of my waterbed. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, Crockett. You live on a boat. Don't you got the motion in the ocean going all the time on that thing? (laughs) (laughs) Eventually, a man comes up from behind Judge Ferguson. They start talking. He stands out a lot. He's like an Italian mobster looking guy. You see Ferguson go really from being really happy to really upset. And then somehow the duo loses them when the crowd is standing up and down. The man is gone magically. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, poof. <laughs> and this is where it becomes really obvious that Bill Russell, former NBA player Bill Russell, is playing in the steps. They take him out to a yacht, and he is, like, dragging his shoulders on the ceiling of the yacht. Yeah, it's so bad you wonder why they kept filming in there. It's really obviously an uncomfortable. Like, <laughs> why even do that shot? <laughs> After they totally yeah. rebuilt the courthouse, why couldn't they get a little bit taller yacht? Yeah, or yeah, shrink him. Yeah, they I mean, just should have just shrunk him down. <laughs> It's clearly like like six foot ceilings or something, you know. <laughs> this is where we meet Pagone. So Michael Richards comes out, and we know him as Kramer. He's not threatening, but he is really threatening in this episode as Judge Ferguson's loan shark. Yeah, Kramer comes out, and you know he's all. I almost felt like he was overacting a bit w- with some of the threats he was going through. Yeah, I know they were kind of ridiculous. <laughs> and what we learn is that. 
judge the judge has fallen way behind on his payments pagone isn't putting up with it anymore and he floats out there not float sorry he floats and then commits to it that the miami university basketball game the playoff game is coming up and that his son plays for him it'd be fantastic if his son would throw the game and then pagone would be able to make a whole bunch of money off it he gives them two days to decide what to do the next day castillo tells to do it they got the cash for Berlioz. And they got approval of the bug Benedict's office. Thompson and Switek are going to be working that, which is interesting that Castillo says that because then Zito and Switek work that. And then Crockett is going to be working on Ferguson. Yeah, and that they, they got a bu- they got approval to bug a judge's office really quick. Yeah, I mean, they I know. had to go to a judge and get a judge to sign off on permission to bug another judge's office. Like that's just that's <laughs> not an easy thing to do. Next, after leaving the precinct, we head over to the Ferguson household for the first time. And this is another short scene where we see Dad. He tries to talk to his son, Matt, uh, but they get interrupted. And then the judge just goes into his office and looks around at his trophies. You can see that him and his son have a really good relationship. So it's going to be really hard for him to ask him to throw a game like this. And he even stops and stares at one picture that looks like, as most of you mentioned, like they just took it yesterday. Well, he's wearing the same <laughs> suit, and I'm like 100% sure the kid's wearing the same shirt. So, yeah, it's like they took that picture out on the lawn, and they were like, okay, put this on the wall, and then pretend he just took off his tie. That's all. It's the only difference. You know, I don't know. It's just kind of weird. <laughs> uh, now we go over to Benedict's office for the first time, and we have like a fake tension scene. The reason why I say it's fake is because it's, it's not the same as it is in modern times where like, because what's happening is that Trudy is planning the bug on Benedict's office. They're going to have Berlioz come in and ask him to set up a bribe with Judge Ferguson. And so Gina is in her uniform and then Trudy is dressed as a pink phone repair person who says that she's there to, let's see, I wrote it down, to quote, test the ringer equivalencies. (laughs) Yeah, that's a legitimate thing that they really do. (laughs) And Gina looks really uncomfortable in a police uniform. (laughs) Security guard uniform. (laughs) Uh They they just get access to the office like so easily. Like, oh yeah, just go on in. (laughs) And there's this fake tension where Zito and Switek see Benedict outside their radio ahead to them saying that he He's on his way up, but then it's never it's never close. You never see like them pass each other in the hallway or anything like that. It's just a little bit of a rush. In fact, Trudy didn't even know. Yeah, because Gina never told her. They said you better tell her to hurry up. She never said anything. <laughs> she stood out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, he else is getting ready. He's really nervous. They're going to have him go in and talk to Benedict. And in that co- co- conversation, it finally comes down to at the end. It's like, he says, what does it take to be a special case? Because Benedict says, I wonder why he helped Ortega was because it was a special case. And so now the vice is in with Benedict. They got Berlioz to, to have Benedict commit to taking cash for it. Then we go over again to the Sunblazers, where... Matt is practicing, and Melissa, you caught really fast as he's walking up the sign that says, Welcome Students, up in front of the college. It says student parking, and it's like a fake, I mean, it's like a temporary sign. It's like on, (laughs) it's not even (laughs) cemented into the ground or anything. You can see like the bottoms, like you can just lift it up and pick it up and go somewhere else with it. It's like, okay. (laughs) I was distracted. I didn't notice the sign. I was distracted by Bill Russell in that little tiny car. Yeah. You see him come rolling up, and he's like hunched over in the car, like. <laughs> it matches with what the theme has been so far. It's like Bill Russell as uncomfortable as possible. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Art. Yeah. What's this? What's the smallest car we could find? Yeah. Get that <laughs> one. <laughs> so he goes in, he talks to his son, but then decides, you know, he's having second thoughts. And so he waits until after practice and. Then he meets his son out in the parking lot. And this is where it's like, these are two former or current <laughs> NBA players. The acting isn't, the acting isn't fantastic. Uh, no, it's not. Actually, it's kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, you the ass a game or what? Oh, dad, get with the program here. <laughs> son turns it down. The dad gets in his little tiny uh, cruise. And has and has some thinking time, which is a common theme through the rest of the episode, because the judge is going to have lots of thinking time moments throughout the rest of the episode. <laughs> they had to fill some time, okay? So maybe they needed to stall <laughs> yeah. it out a little bit. Maybe the story was a oh, little thin you, in some spots. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, Sad Bill has still got it, though. He drains that shot. 
<laughs> so I guess later that night, we're at the precinct, and they picked up Pagone's muscle, and they're not really interrogating him. He's just in the room. And then Gina comes in and says that they've gotten another approval for a bug at Ferguson's house, and Crockett says that he's suspicious of something bigger happening with Ferguson because they can't put together what's exactly happening here, and then says, release Pagone's muscle. So I don't even know what this scene was for. I don't know. Why did they have to get a separate warrant to bug his house? And why was that harder than bugging the <laughs> judge's chambers? I don't know. I don't know what the deals with the scene at all. Why and how or why they picked up Pagone's guy. Again, the next day we head over to Sun Blazer prior. Matt's really despondent. He's He's got, you know, obviously his dad has asked him to throw a playoff game. So he's he's just not totally in the game. And Tubbs and Crockett go to talk to him about his dad. And then Matt says, no, I'm not going to talk to you. I don't even know who you are. Which most of you said they didn't even announce themselves as cops. No, they never yeah, tell they, him that they're police. They never say like, hey, we're cops. They, they said, we're, we're just people. We're people that can help your dad. And he's like, I'm not going to talk to you. I don't know who you are. <laughs> and, and I thought for a minute, Crockett's like reaching in his pocket. I'm like, oh, he's going to pull out his badge. But he didn't. He just pulled out his hand. <laughs> so I don't know what that was me about. Me too. <laughs> me too. I thought he was going to, I thought he was going to pull his badge out. And I'm like, so Matt's sitting there and two random guys walk up and like, hey, what's the deal with your dad? <laughs> yeah, that's not suspicious at all. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end of this, Crockett says, well, he's not going to be enough for us anyway. And then they leave. So, so what was the scene about again? Nothing. <laughs> Like, like a lot of the scenes in this. <laughs> yeah. At the Ferguson house, the BTM are monitoring Benedict, and they see that he's going to meet with Ferguson. And Is it this... weird that they're monitoring Benedict while eating eggs, Benedict? <laughs> <laughs> What's weird here for me is that suddenly Judge Ferguson has a change of heart. He tells Benedict, I don't want your money. I'm not helping you. We are done doing business and kicks him out. He is at his most desperate for money. What's with the change of heart all of a sudden? I, I don't know. I mean, I guess he feels guilty about because, I mean, it is kind of a big deal. If his son gets caught throwing a game, that could be the end of his basketball career. They do hear, the B team does hear a brief conversation between father and son where son says he can't throw a game, but he can sit out. A game. And this is where the next scene, we'll, we're going to skip over Tubbs and Crockett. L- listening to the recording, go straight to Pagone's boat, where Ferguson's going to go tell him that his son's just going to sit out. But Pagone is not down with that at all. He wants him to actually throw the game. And that if he can't convince his son to do it, then Pagone and his partner, Marco, will go talk to him. Which, which makes no sense. Why does he have to actually throw the game in order for it to... I mean, wouldn't that make it more obvious? If he just in the last minute sits instead mm-hmm. of playing, uh, you know, and says, oh, he had an injury or an illness, team still loses. He still wins, you know, and no one's the wiser that the fix is in. All he's got to do is fake a freaking fever. He could easily fake an injury. The only thing I can think of is that they want to make sure that they actually lose. Like there's a guarantee that there's someone on the court the whole time sabotaging the entire game. Yeah, that's got to be the only yeah. thing. Unless they're just really well, trying I mean, to punish the judge or something. You know? mm-hmm. Cause, I mean, e- even in that end, like if he's on the court, he's still only one player on the court. You know, if the other players are playing really well, even if he's missing every shot, um, <laughs> still not a guarantee they're going to lose. True. That's true. Yeah, because someone, as we mentioned, the who, who, the actor who's playing this son, he had back-to-back 50-point games. Like, anyone can show up and have a great game. Mm -hmm. So now we have some more Judge Ferguson thinking time. He heads back. It's it's the next day. He's at the park that he used to play at as a kid. We had learned earlier that Ferguson had come from a hard background. He really worked his way up. That's why he one of the reasons why he was so respected. And Crockett just sneaks up, sneaks up on him and says, hey, this is a conversation without the badge. We know what you're up to. Help us get Pagone, and I might be able to help you out. But Ferguson's like, I'm done. I'm in too deep. He's given up. And he's just going to, he says he's not going to make deals anymore. He's going to face his own problems. So the two things that catch me with this scene is one, Crockett basically just throw, you know, cats out of the bag, throws the investigation to the side, even though they had to go through all this to bug his office. Basically just goes, hey, yeah, we're investigating you. And then I love how he tries to play that, oh, I'm a father too card. Really? <laughs> really, Crockett, yeah, you're a dad? I know. Dominic's like, you are? Like when we were watching, he's like, he is? Like, what? <laughs> we talked about your yeah. son since he left. 
My kids and I talked about him once in in the I whole haven't even seen a picture left. in his house. He has no boat. pictures. No. You can't have pictures on a boat, John. Don't you know that? <laughs> they just fall right off because of the wave. So this is where we're at the last couple moments of the episode here. And this is where things really start to come together. We have the, the Sun Blazer locker room before the game. His judge calls his son. He tells his son, hey, play the best game of your life. It's, I got it all worked out. Don't worry about it. Just go just go, ha- go play a great game, son. At the precinct, and so the B team, Zito and Crockett, overhear that conversation. At the precinct, Sonny is trying to make a deal for Ferguson with the district attorney and with the prosecutor to say, he'll get us stone. They're not having to give Judge Ferguson a break. They, they're not going to cut him any deals. So they're ready to give up. But luckily, at the last second, the phone rings and it's Zito telling Sonny that Ferguson called his son and is now heading out to the marina. Crockett tells Tubbs, you go to the game. I'm going to go check in on Ferguson. The Tubbs thing doesn't matter. We don't see anything that's happened there except for some work. <laughs> Ferguson is fast on his way out to Pagone's boat. He gets out there with his gun. With, with a gun, he pulls up to the boat, t- tells Marco to go for a swim, and then comes into Pagone with his girl watching the basketball game. He Which, opens up. Pointing the gun at Marco the goon and telling him to take a swim. Like, what, what does that really achieve? Okay, now he's wet. He can just swim back to the boat. <laughs> Maybe he couldn't swim and he knew it. No. <laughs> <laughs> he opens up the door to the bedroom. He sees Pagone. Pagone's like, what are you doing here? And Ferguson says, I'm here to settle my debt. He shoots and kills Pagone. Turns out, he turns around, heads heads to go out, and Crockett's there waiting for him. He's there just a few seconds too late. Crockett's got his gun drawn. He's telling the judge, you don't, it doesn't have to be this way. You don't have to do these things. The judge slowly turns the gun. So he turns the gun on himself, commits suicide, freeze frame, episode over. Yeah, that's good. Mm-hmm. Also, thank God. Ortega <laughs> got away. Yeah, I know. I was sweating it that she wasn't going to get away. She was well, she's pregnant. Friends. I was worried I about the baby. <laughs> well, her boyfriend has a bad back, too. I mean, you got to feel sorry for her. <laughs> this episode got real dark real fast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I like the seriousness of it. Like I was saying in the beginning. I would have liked to see a little bit more of the Ortega storyline because it just seems meaningless at this point by the time you get to the end of the episode. And they could have shown us them arresting Benedict, but they just mm-hmm. mention it at the park scene in passing. Yeah, because that's a like, pretty big count. deal. That's a pretty big deal that they busted a lawyer that was bribing judges. Yeah, and I mean, that's that that was where the investigation started. So I kind of felt like that should have been included. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe <laughs> we take out one of the sad bill scenes. <laughs> no, those and we include. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, let's go talk about the music because unlike last week, we actually have some music in this episode. All right, John, what do you got for this week? Because this is the one week I didn't take a sneak peek. All right, so we actually got a little bit of music, and with a little bit of digging, we got some interesting, uh, interesting stuff. We'll start with the the biggest artist. The first song in the episode is "Gambler" by Madonna. So I'm gonna start with a little bit about Madonna, and then I'm gonna go to a little bit about the song. So let's start with Madonna Louise Sacconi was born in on August 16th, 1958, which means she is 58 years young. So she's been active since 1979 to now. She is the highest selling female artist of all time, according to Guinness Book of World Records. She has sold over 300 million Mm. records. She is the highest grossing solo touring artist. And that is not, that is both men and women. Since 1990, she has earned $1.3 billion uh, from touring. <laughs> wow. Yeah. She's also done some acting. She's She's been in movie... She was in the movie Desperately Seeking Susan, which continually comes up in Vice stuff. Uh, apparently... The showrunner really liked that movie because a lot of people keep showing up in that one. But she was also in Dick Tracy, Avita, and A League of Their Own. So, which are all actually fantastic movies. Yeah, they're actually I am not going to list. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to list any of the other movies she did through her own Maverick films because they're just terrible. 
It's terrible. <laughs> terrible. She founded the entertainment company Maverick that does Maverick recording, Maverick films. She founded that in 1992, and it has actually been incredibly successful. She has made a ton hmm. of money off of that. She was married. So during this episode, she was married to Sean Penn. She had actually just got married to Sean Penn in 1985. She was married to him from 85 to 89. Then they divorced, and then she would marry Guy Ritchie in 2000, and they would divorce in 2008. So little known <laughs> fact, she has six kids. Getting stuff um, done. Getting stuff done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, now I want to jump back. So this song, Gambler, this is the actual, this is the instrumental remit. This was during the Gambler montage with the horse, with the dogs chasing the horses. <laughs> this song was actually also used in the movie Vision Quest. She actually did yeah. two songs on that soundtrack. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, funny story. She also made a brief appearance as a club singer in the movie Vision Quest. Yeah, it's right in the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. So, also, in 1985, in her first concert tour, the Beastie Boys were her opening act. Wow, good for them. Two other details. She's from Bay City, Michigan, but she moved to New York in 1977 to actually pursue a career in modern dance. Because that's a thing. <laughs> um, and she actually worked as a waitress at Dunkin' Donuts while she was trying to pursue her dream. Are there and waitresses at Dunkin' Donuts? I don't do. No. I, <laughs> I've never been to one. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I, I I didn't know either. Maybe in the seventies there were first performed with the group The Breakfast Club which she was actually touring as a backup singer. She started dating a guy named Dan Gilmore. They formed The Breakfast Club while living in an abandoned synagogue. <laughs> she would leave that to briefly form a band called Emmy with her new boyfriend. And I didn't even write his name down at this point. <laughs> then she would get her own record deal with Sire Records and re release the, the album Eponymous in 83, and then Like a Virgin in 84, which would be her first number one. But that's a little bit about M M Madonna. Our next song is P colon Machinery. <laughs> and it is by the group Propaganda off the album Secret Wish. This is a German new wave band that was formed in 1982. They, they never really charted in the U.S., but they did really well in Europe. They were formed in... Dusseldorf, West Germany, by Rolf Dorper, who was a member of the band <laughs> Die Krubs. Cru and apparently they're still together today. We'll give you a pass on the German, John. We'll yeah. give you a Thank pass. You. Thank you. <laughs> so they were a trio with Andreas Pine and Susan Freytag. This is the funny thing. He formed this band in 1982. And they started releasing singles, but they didn't release an album until 85. The reason being is that they were signed to the label ZTT, and the label had to put all of their money into this this unexpectedly popular band that was also signed to them called Frankie Goes to Hollywood. <laughs> so the popularity propaganda was kind of stunted because ZZ, ZTT was putting all their money toward Frankie Goes to Hollywood, so they wouldn't actually release an album their debut album until July 1985, which A Secret Wish would be critically acclaimed, would be followed up by this very single in August. Later in 85, they were introduced to a lawyer named Brian Carr. Brian Carr was the lawyer who helped settle the case between the Sex Pistols and their record company, Public Image. Mm. Basically, he informed them that they could continue making music for, for the rest of their life for ZZ, ZTT and never make a dime <laughs> according to their contract. Wow. So one member quit, one member quit. The duo continued to release another album after a 14 month legal battle. And then they would break up and reunite a couple times, once in the 90s and then in the 2000s. And the record industry, like have a contract where you won't make any money. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, not only we not make any money, she won't make any money for the rest of your life, no matter how much <laughs> music you make. So our last song is The Water's Too Deep by Jim Gilstrap. 
And this is another Vice-only song. It was recorded exclusively for Vice and never appeared on any album or single or on any other platform. Gilstrap, been mostly a studio artist and a backup singer. He began his career after serving in Vietnam, performing with the group Doodle Town Pipers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And the Doodle Town Pipers. <laughs> the Doodle Town Pipers are, they didn't have a lot of good stuff to say about them. So, uh, <laughs> the, they, they were, let's see, they, let's see, this is how they put it. They were dull as lint, but weirdly charming. <laughs> so, also known as, uh, white bread music. <laughs> so, and one talk show host cleverly referred to them as the Poodle Town Diapers. <laughs> wow. Wow. Ouch. That's, a, so, that's such ouch. a bad burn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to come back to the Doodle Town Pipers because there's actually a twist to that story. They did work with a plethora of artists, but we're going to come back to that. We're going to focus more on Gilstrap himself. Gilstrap was also a backup singer in the 70s for Stevie Wonder, known mostly for singing two lines of the hit, You Are the Sunshine of My Life. He also is the co-lead to the theme show, Good Times. Only real big hit, uh, he released two albums in the 70s, in, in the 70s. 1975 Swing Your Daddy and 1977 Love Talk, with Swing Your Daddy being the only really big hit single of his career. He also did backup vocals for the movie Greeks in 78. So wow. he also sang the theme song for the cartoon Tailspin in the 90s. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yes. And I could actually sing that theme song to you right now, but I won't. <laughs> so jumping back to the Doodle Town Pipers, and I just wanted to throw this in there. <laughs> we have to go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't let go. I can't let go of the Doodle Town Pipers. They're almost <laughs> oingo boingo. Um, <laughs> I wanted to read you some of the stuff from the other band members of the Doodle Town Pipers, because obviously they weren't very popular. People made fun of them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know why. <laughs> so, but this is where it gets weird. So here's the other members. George Wilkins was a TV, film, and amusement park composer who composed and uh, basically who worked for Disney, got a job and worked at, as Disney's director of music from 1979 on, which is the amusement park stuff. Mm -hmm. So there is a good possibility that, you know, It's a Small World, after all, is composed by him. <laughs> then there was Bernard Brillstein, who is a TV producer and talent agent, who produced shows like Hee Haw, The Muppet Show, and Episodes of The Sopranos. He also produced the movies The Blues Brothers, Ghostbusters, and Happy Gilmore. Let that- Wow. Yes. Okay. The other- Another member of the group, Jerome Weintraub. Jerome Weintraub was a producer and talent agent organi who organized tours for Elvis, Sinatra, he managed a then unknown John Denver. He organized concerts for Zeppelin and Neil Diamond. He would, he produced films, The Karate Kid and all of the Ocean's Eleven remakes, as well as running the sh the HBO series, The Brink and Behind the Candelabra. Uh, HBO actually made a documentary based on that guy's life. So, and if that's not enough, one of the part time band members with Jim was Teresa Graves, who was also in Laugh-In. The most notably thing on her resume is sh she was on a show called Turn On. And Turn On was uh, was like Laugh-In. It was a sketch comedy show that is known as one of the biggest flops in TV history. <laughs> it had they only filmed two episodes. Only one episode ever aired before it was cancelled. Wow. But so, literally, the rest of the band is like the smartest people in the room, right? Yeah. They were too yeah. good. They were too good for Hollywood. They they made a funny band just for the hell of it because they were smarter. They yeah. were literally smarter than everyone else. Yeah. They went on. Uh, they left the Dual Town Pipers and essentially made money hand over fist from Hollywood working on successful stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you want to read something interesting, Teresa Graves, the one who was on that pilot, um, I could go more into, there's a lot of interesting stuff with her because she got really into Jehovah's, she became a Jehovah's Witness, got really into the religion and actually quit show business for that stuff. And so there's a lot more interesting stuff there. But yeah, it is insane just how talented that group of people was compared to just how badly 
people just, just not ripped them about apart. The yeah. 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 And, and the funny thing is, is that the Dilltown Pipers, they worked with so many artists. A lot of the artists that I mentioned that they produce, that the, that these guys produced out after the fact, they worked with just as many during the time when they were with the Doodletown Pipers. So it's this, it's this amazing, crappy little band that they, people called White Bread actually housed like these amazingly successful people. So. Yeah. Wow. So there's your music. <clears throat> wow. Well, we never thought we saw the Doodletown Pipers come in in this music segment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, let's go over and give our final thoughts on this episode because um, although you two liked it, I wasn't a fan of this episode. So let's go over and give our final thoughts on this one. All right, guys, I'll kick off this week. That way I can get my complaining out of the way out of you guys who enjoy this episode. Bill Russell was actually really good. There was a couple of scenes that were rough, but otherwise he did a really good job. I was really surprised and, and really enjoyed Bill Russell's character as Judge Ferguson. Uh, there's just so many gaps in the story that, you know, like scenes that, that didn't need to be there that the story just moved really slow for me, which I think John, you're going to give the total opposite of it in, in your final thoughts, but it just moved really slow. There wasn't a whole lot that was going on. Pagone seemed like such, such a wasted character. He, he was so fearful, like everyone was really afraid of him. And then we obviously missed the whole part of Ortega. So I'm not saying it was a bad episode. It just wasn't my favorite one from season two. It was all right. This middle of the road episode from Miami Vice. John, what are your final thoughts? So yeah, it's pretty much the opposite. I felt like I wanted to know more about all of the stuff that they kept skipping over. I felt like they rushed through it a lot, you know? I really enjoyed the everything with the Bill Russell storyline. With him being a gambling addict and having to go to his son and ask him to throw a game. And like, like I really enjoyed that core storyline. But I also wanted to know more about the Ortega storyline. I wanted to know more about, I wanted to see the arrest or the sting. Benedict, you know, I felt like Paul Greco's character wasn't, was hardly utilized at all it, mm -hmm. in, in the episode. You know, I felt like this could have easily been a two part episode because it really, it was really a strong emotional episode. And this is mm -hmm. one of the episodes where it wasn't, they didn't do. A lot of like little silly crap in between, like with the bug van and the little, you know, the little jokes and stuff. It was pretty much strong from, from beginning to end, just a strong story about this guy, uh, this judge with a gambling problem and basically how it was affecting his relationship with his son, how mm -hmm. Crockett related to him, didn't feel like he was a bad guy, almost wanted to help him, which is different than a lot of the criminals that we, they go after. I was really intrigued by that. I felt like they could have expanded on it a lot more. And, and even the ending felt rushed. He goes mm -hmm. in, he kills Pagone, he comes out and bumps in the, in the Crockett, and it's a super heavy scene. He kills himself. Right in front of Crockett, while his kid's playing basketball, has no idea what's going on. Crockett, who wanted to try and save him, and, and, and instead watches him shoot himself. And they just rush through it. Bam, bam, bam. 30 seconds. Freeze frame. The ending should have been strung out longer. So I I just, I felt like this, they, they could have done a two-part episode. My only thought is, is that they couldn't afford or talk Bill Russell and Bernard King into doing two episodes. So it sounds like a win in your book, though, that you like this episode. It is. This is probably one of my. This is probably one of my favorite episodes of season two. Hmm. Mosa, what, what what are your final thoughts? You know that I like this episode. It's not <laughs> one of my favorites, but I do like it a lot. Um, I like the portion of it that has like feelings in it for once. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> Miami Vice. A lot of it is it's it's like heavy hitting stuff, right? We're talking about like prostitution and murder and drugs and and a lot of the times I feel like it gets glossed over like, that these were they're actually policemen and they're supposed to have feelings about things and mm -hmm. that they're supposed to be, be conflicted. Even though I think that maybe Crockett's not the best father in the world, <laughs> I don't think he's going to win Father of the Year. There's no uh you know awards being given to him, but the fact that he identified himself as being a father and he felt that the judge was a good person who had just gotten in over his head and he kind of felt sympathy for him. It's nice to see feelings, to actually see emotion to the show other than just like, we're going to arrest these people or we're going to kill them. <laughs> Those are the only two choices, apparently. Don't get out any other way. And if you don't, if they, they don't get killed or they don't get arrested, then we, they kill themselves. If yeah. you notice, that's a big thing. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I like the episode. It, 
it's up there as one of my favorites. Not my favorite, but um, mm-hmm. it was painful, though, I have to say, because the basketball players were not, <laughs> were not <laughs> going to win any Golden Globes or, I don't know, daytime Emmys or anything for, it, for their performances. But I liked it. It had the right amount of um, – there was not too much silliness in it, which I think it didn't need any silly stuff in there, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think that that was the right episode for that. Yeah. So – I was okay with it. I don't think, um, I did think it kind of moved slow for me in the middle parts. It was kind of slow. I felt like we had been watching it for a lot longer than we had. So it felt like, uh, Tubbs didn't really participate enough in the episode. So. Yeah, he was almost non-existent. Yeah, he wasn't mm-hmm. really a focus at all in this episode. Well, we would love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. We would love to hear your thoughts on this episode. I was kind of rough on it. So if you like this episode or if you have some criticism we'd love to hear it from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com be sure to check out the website go with the heat.com find all the ways to subscribe you can find all the ways to contact us we would love 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 to hear from you about miami vice not just this episode but anything miami vice related email go with the heat at gmail.com that's gonna do it for us this week and we'll see y'all next time go out and download some doodle town pipers music we're gonna bring it back <laughs> somebody has to do it <laughs>